All right. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, so Polkit couldn't make it today. Uh, so instead, we're going to have uh, some uh, sort of interesting uh, side information uh, for myself, Avery, and Gah, uh, about sort of the missing content uh, in reinforcement learning. So hopefully some pieces that'll help you get from these algorithms that we're discussing in this class to um, you know, actual projects and experiments that you can run and papers you can publish. So with that, let's start. Um, if anybody has questions, as always, you can put them in the chat. All right, great. Um, so as I said before, uh, you know, in this class, we teach you, you know, algorithms and maybe how to come up with algorithms ideas, but what do you have to do in order to get from there to you know, actual results that you can put in papers? And the answer is, you know, there's a lot of things. You, know, there's, you have to choose your environment and your benchmarks. You have to choose how you actually implement your algorithms, how you deploy your algorithms, how you manage experiments at scale. So all these pieces are pieces that, you know, usually you have to sort of figure out yourself. So our hope is that we can sort of provide some nice references to help you uh, spin up a little bit faster. So I'm going to start off by talking about some common environments, simulators, and benchmarks in uh, computational sensory motor learning. So certainly the uh, standard here is OpenAI Gym. A lot of you have probably already heard about that. Um, OpenAI Gym provides basically a standardized interface to interact with uh, environments as an agent. Um, simplest example is Cartpole over here, uh, really simple action space and state space. And then the examples sort of spin up in complexity all the way to uh, more complex tasks, such as this half cheetah task and even Atari games. Um, generally for continuous control, uh, you would start off by testing your algorithm on cart pull and then move up to some of these uh, sort of walking tasks implemented in Majoko. So these are you know, half cheetah, biped, ant. Um, for discrete control, usually the benchmark is Atari from pixels. Uh, and for manipulation, uh, some common Benchmarks in OpenAI Gym are um, the suite of uh, situations where you have a PR2 just pushing around blocks in a simulated environment. So that's where it could be used. Moving on from OpenAI Gym, um, if you're interested in training RL agents to uh, play video games, there are some really common examples. So uh, Doom is a really common video game people use. Uh, there are libraries that let you access pixels and uh, produce actions from Python and other programming languages. Uh, Atari 2600 obviously is another major benchmark. Uh, StarCraft is a little bit harder to train, uh, but theoretically possible in their uh, open source bindings for that. Um, also Minecraft more recently, uh, both bindings uh, to create agents and also a large data set uh, for supervised learning, which, which could be useful to you. Next, moving on to the fun stuff, uh, robotics. So here are some really common platforms uh, people use. Again, robotics is sort of splintered, so not everybody's going to be using the same platform, but these are some of the more common ones that would hopefully allow you to somewhat better compare your results with other papers. Um, so for manipulation, people often use UR5s, which is a type of uh, collaborative robot arm simulation. So we have a library called AI Robot that helps you do that uh, in, a, in a nice way for interacting with complex learning algorithms. Uh, there's also PyRobot from Facebook, uh, which supports the local bot, which is mobile robot with a little arm on it. Uh, the Minitor is a popular low cost uh, quadruped, which has pretty dynamic behaviors. And there's a PyBullet simulation environment for that. And then Google also has the RoboSuite. So these are robots with uh, these dynamical actuators that either can be configured in this uh, uh, kitty shape. So this is the Dick Kitty on the left um, and uh, Dick Claw on the right. Uh, and these are common for running low cost experiments on manipulation and locomotion. And there are also simulation environments for these. Uh, in addition to these environments, there are also sort of more general environments relating to, you know, higher level task planning. Uh, so 
An example is uh, Microsoft's AirSim, uh, which lets you both control uh, cars and drones in a simulated environment. Uh, there's AI Habitat, which is a somewhat near photorealistic environment for navigating 3D spaces as a robot and also the related RoboThor environment, which is, has this photorealistic simulator, but also uh, physical environments that you can actually set up and they can, you know, they tell you all the, all the furniture that you have to buy in order to build one of these real environments for a real robot. Um, so let's say you don't want to use one of these platforms, you want to implement your own robot or, you know, then you probably want to look at these simulators. You also may find that uh, the robot you want is already implemented in multiple simulators and you have to make that choice. So here are some of the common ones. Uh, there's Drake, which is more new and less common in RL research, but it's an open source simulator from MIT and the Toyota Research Institute. Uh, it supports model-based optimization and differentiation and really complex tooling around that. And it's a pretty fast simulator. The only caveat is it's, it's somewhat newer and, and thus less stable. Hybel is really popular in uh, the RL literature and continuous control in robotics. Uh, it's open source and it's Nobel, so you can supply your robot configuration in a URDF similar to how you would do in all these tools. Um, and it, it generally just works and it's pretty fast. The only constraint is it's somewhat less powerful than some of these other tools. So you may not be able to implement as complex controllers or dynamics, um, but it's very popular in the research literature. Uh, some other simulators, Gazebo, which is part of ROS, Robot Operating System. Um, so that's very popular, but it's a little bit slower um, and clunkier. You usually have to integrate you know, a lot of ROS in order to use it, which often predicates uh, annoying prerequisites only running on Ubuntu and uh, often Python 2 instead of Python 3. Uh, however, there's a really strong ecosystem around this. So a lot of robots are supported in ROS, uh, a lot of simulated sensors and um, planning algorithms as well. Uh, and high quality graphics and, and rendering algorithms. So there can be advantages to this as well. And finally, Majoko. Majoko is what OpenAI Jim uses in its continuous control tasks, or some of them. Um, and it's pretty fast and robust, but it's closed source and requires a license. Uh, notably, if you're part of uh, EI in CSAIL, uh, you can get a license. Uh, we have one. Um, but it's still uh, maybe less common for new robots because of that. And, new benchmarks. Outside of these, so these simulators that I mentioned before, you know, they generally are used for simulating rigid body objects, but there are also more niche simulators used to simulate things that don't fall into that. So NVIDIA Flex is one example, and it can be used for uh, simulating soft bodies and particles and all those weird things that the other simulators won't support. If you're interested, you can look into that. Um, once you've picked an environment, you may want to play with some benchmark algorithms uh, just to see what performance you can get before maybe you implement your own. Um, so some libraries that come with implementations of popular RL algorithms are listed here. Um, they're sort of, I, I would verify them on benchmarks that you trust uh, before using them. Uh, they're not always super stable and they don't always necessarily work very well. Uh, some important things to look for are the ability to reproduce results and being able to multi-process environments. Uh, for a lot of these algorithms, they support uh, sampling from multiple environments at once, and that can become really important when you're trying to run experiments at scale. As a rule of thumb, uh, here are some basically um, rules of thumb as to which algorithms to pick as baselines, depending on your situation. Uh, this is a pretty broad uh, approximation for what is correct. So your mileage may vary. Um, and we'll discuss all these algorithms uh, in greater depth, but you can, you can refer back to this if you're looking for baselines. Yeah. All right. So with that, I think I'm passing this off to uh, either Avery or Gunn. Uh, we'll talk about sort of scaling up experiments. I'll take great, then.
Um, okay, can you guys uh, see my screen? Yes. Okay, awesome. So let's try that. Cool. Um, Um, so yeah, uh, today we're going to talk about like uh, doing like uh, RL reinforcement learning research at a scale. Um, this is kind of going to be like a similar to the uh, missing semester thing. We're going to cover like a lot of technical stuff that uh, I guess you don't typically talk about in class. Um, so the overall structure is going to be some high level like motivations of uh, like what is the like, key focus of uh, kind of like uh, these technical engineer aspects in like uh, reinforcement learning research. Uh, and then like uh, we're going to talk about like uh, some of the tools we use to actually scale up a research to like higher level. And then finally, we're actually going to do some like uh, live demos that like I think will be helpful uh, to actually show like uh, these tools uh, kind of like in action. Okay. So the first question like, we kind of like want to just like uh, uh, ask uh, ourselves is basically like what is the motivation for like all of the things we're trying to do. Um, so the goal, uh, like, uh, of uh, kind of like this lecture and like a lot of things we do, like on the technical aspect, is uh, to uh, basically produce impactful research. Um, and like, uh, the first question is like, what makes like a research work impactful? And like, uh, one of the like uh, common answers you hear from like uh, our senior folks is that like a research will be impactful if uh, it creates like new axes of uh, capabilities, or actually like uh, like uh, basically provides us like new understandings of a problem. So like I'll give like a few uh, very like uh, uh, high level examples of like a uh, research that are impactful and like uh, basically how they kind of fit into this like create new access capabilities versus like you know like provide new understanding kind of like a uh, framework. Um, so let's take Lynette for example. Like uh, the story was that uh, Yan Lukun was actually carrying this uh, uh, like a giant computer with like a live demo of like a, like a, the Agnes like Lynette running uh, on his laptop. He was like walking around like in the conference, like showing people how awesome it is. You can actually like uh, do like recognition like at real time, like from like uh, images, like of people like actually like written on paper. Um, so like the the new capability here is that they're able to actually like a uh, uh, like a uh, uh, classify like uh, hundreds of digits like directly from like camera input. So this is actually, this is actually like almost like uh, 20, 30 years back and it's like very significant at that time. And then like we have like AlexNet plus like, you know, like it sold like kind of like uh, on ImageNet, it was actually uh, at least like a 10, like a, a 10 or 11% uh, like higher in terms of accuracy than the next runner up. Uh, and they're also able to like scale like a, like a, like a Basically the same like architecture. Like, it's basically like scale of Lynette, just up to like a much larger model, and they're able to like basically produce like a very good performance. And then like recently, we also have like AlphaFold from DeepMind. Um, I guess like one of the differences here is that you know like if your problem is not image recognition but like protein folding, you only need to solve that problem once. Um, so like here we're actually showing like the bar chart of like the performance on the uh, like uh, CSP like. Uh, like a challenge over the years. And you can see that like, AlphaFold is like, has this like kind of like bump in terms of performance. So these are researches that basically provided like a new axis of uh, capabilities. And like some of the works uh, will basically be uh, more intermediary in the sense that they don't directly provide like these uh, new capabilities, but uh, they provide understandings that like, uh, like takes, makes us closer to like uh, these type of uh, like uh, capability breakthroughs. So I just want to motivate like basically like uh, the, the lecture with this is that like, uh, like we're kind of here to like uh, basically try to do research that creates real impact by uh, creating these uh, new axes of capabilities or like uh, make it closer to that goal. So the next question is, how do we do that? How can we actually do impactful research? Uh, so like personally, like, I, like when I do research, I try to focus on like these two questions. The, the question is, like trying to understand like in this uh, like application domain, like what is the real problem that actually hurts your performance? Uh, so the question is like, try to understand what is the problem or ask yourself like what the problem is. And the second, second question is uh, to actually create real impact, you actually need to like actually uh, have like a baseline. It's like, you need to be able to answer, answer the question like compared to what? Um, so like uh, the problem will be is basically like why your robot is sad, like why things are not working as it's supposed to. And then like 
uh, compared to what is actually like captured pretty well by this bar chart I just showed earlier, is that like uh, you can see this kind of performance bump comparing to like uh, previous results. So we asked this question, like, what is the problem? Like, uh, the best way to actually understand the problem is to actually play with the algorithms. Um, and one of the shortcuts in like a basically like uh, getting closer to the answer of like what the like to the answer of what is the problem um, is to actually try to like when you play with the algorithm try to actually break it like try to break the algorithm by like uh, through like these different axes of like uh, increasing difficulty. So depend depending on the domain like there are different axes of like uh, these like uh, increasing difficulties that I can actually introduce. Um, like here I'm just going to like basically give a few examples that's more relevant. To to reinforcement learning. So uh, like, uh, so, so, so Josh just talked about like uh, these different domains, right? So one common axis you can actually perturb like uh, uh, your like uh, uh, your algorithm is by making the task more difficult. For example, uh, like uh, when we went from like, when we are trying to like train like a PPO on like Mujoko, like you start with state space, but you can make this, this, this task more difficult by going from uh, like, you know, like a state space to like uh, pixel inputs. And then like if, if uh, like, and, and then like we match actually like uh, match the performance between like a state space, like uh, uh, reinforcement learning and uh, like learning from pixel inputs recently with like a bunch of new techniques such as like a data augmentation. And then now we're actually trying to break it even further by basically introducing like cluttered backgrounds that makes like learn from pixel inputs very difficult. So like the way that like uh, sort of like the field moves is that like, uh, like the frontier of like this kind of like a, a bit, like envelope of ability gets like keep pushing forward and like uh, when you do research you kind of want to like basically get into the zone where things are like they're breaking a little bit but like that's actually still like tangible so that like you can actually introduce one or two techniques and then you can actually like make the algorithm work in this like a sort of like a new area where things were not working before so you can also like a sort of like a remove assumptions for example sometimes we assume Actually, most of the time, like in reinforcement learning, we assume that we have access to the, this reward function. But then to actually get things to work on real robots, like actually it just turned out that like engineering like or instrumenting like a reward is actually fairly challenging. For example, like if you have, have a robot trying to like pour water, you actually have to like basically build instrument, for example, like a scale and try to basically give the robot rewards by like how much water is in the cup or stuff like that. So like another axis is, is to remove these assumptions and then like there's also third axis of increasing complexity and like an uh, example be you know like when robots do like uh, pick a place like uh, pick up like a block and place somewhere else. Um, it's very easy to actually increase the complexity to go from like one block to two blocks to three blocks and then you quickly realize that your method doesn't work. So like, to, to summarize to understand the problem, um, you need to actually play with the uh, existing methods and um, what you can do is that you can try to like break these existing methods in ways that kind of like intuitively makes sense that you want the robot eventually to be able to do, but somehow like breaks the algorithm. And then like, this will basically provide like the grounding for, you know, like uh, for everything that follows. So now like we know like what the problem is, hopefully uh, by uh, like actually playing with it, uh, you probably also gain some intuition, understand basically like why this problem occurs or like what is actually breaking. So next thing is um, you kind of like have some ideas you want to try. Uh, and like, it's very important to actually like uh, keep this question in mind, which is like, how do you actually know that your method actually works? Or how do you actually know that this is the right hypothesis? So uh, like this kind of like a benchmark or like a basically performance metric um, serves like two separate processes, uh, purposes. The first purpose it serves is that it's kind of like an epistemic, kind of like a crutch. Um, it's like a help you get when you do research that helps you understand like how much progress you're actually making. Because like without actually like, measuring like uh, what the baseline was like performing at and like measuring like uh, your proposed new method, you're kind of just like shooting in the dark and you can easily like go in circles. So by having this kind of like a like measurable like a metric, you can actually uh, like uh, know how much progress you're making with each incremental like uh, change you're introducing to the code base. And like so every step is actually like on solid grounds. And then the second uh, purpose this solves is uh, it's also a communication device. So for example, if I'm trying to talk to like, Avery or like talk to Josh about like this new awesome method I introduced, I need to actually tell them like basically like the value and the value can be, is only measurable by like basically the kind of gain it introduces. Uh, 
So like it's a communication device. We actually talk to like uh, your colleagues, uh, your lab mates, or like you know, um, like uh, or like other like people from different institutions. And like this is why you need to keep asking yourself like, how do you know? And like I kind of learned this lesson from my fresh like like a freshman year like uh, organic chemistry teacher uh, McBride. So this this is just a picture of him like telling us like the importance of this question of uh, like how do you know and compare to what like uh, in this context. Okay, so to recap, uh, like uh, our motivation is uh, to uh, produce uh, impactful research, and like it's very helpful to actually like uh, sort of like, keep these two questions in mind. The first question is like, what is the problem, and the second question is how do you know and like compared to what. Um, and like basically, the first step is to figure out like why your robot is said, and then like second one is actually have like this kind of like uh, visualizable like a sort of like measure of like the gain of your of your method. Okay, so that was like a high level motivation of like uh, uh, what we're thinking about, like, uh, like why we're doing all of these things. Uh, the next, next question actually is uh, how do we actually make progress or hopefully fast progress like in our research work? So the, for, the next part is gonna try to answer this question. So like to, uh, uh, we just talked about uh, like choosing impactful problems by like uh, basically playing with the like ex existing code bases. And, uh, and now like uh, you already have some intuition of like, you know, like uh, some like key insights of maybe we can actually solve this particular problem under this context with uh, like a, this like a method X. The next step, uh, it's, it, it's important to realize that um, it's very important to actually build on top of others instead of like starting from scratch. And that's especially important when you're doing reinforcement learning because uh, like if you talk to anyone in the lab, uh, like uh, one common thing is that, oh yeah, like there was this uh, like initialization that was really important. Um, for example, um, like a particular baseline, it wouldn't work if you actually change the initial, like for example, red or like the did augmentation code base wouldn't really work, wouldn't actually match the uh, performance they claim in the paper if you actually change the initialization of the network, which is totally like kind of like, it's kind of expected, but it's also a little unexpected. And if you didn't know this and you just like implement from scratch, it's one of like five or 10 things that you need to get right in order to actually produce some result. And um, the chance for it to get all 10 right, like, uh, like from the beginning, is pretty low. So like, the, the, the key point here is that try to build on top of others and try to like basically find uh, the closest neighbor to your idea in the space of all available, like publicly available, like reproduce, reproducible, like uh, research repositories. And then like start from there instead of writing from your own. Because there are too many things going on in those code bases and it's too hard to actually like uh, get everything right from scratch. And then like after hopefully you find the closest neighbor in the space of uh, available repositories for what you want to do, uh, the first thing you want to do is that you want to focus on reproducing their analysis. Because again, like we talk about like compared to what and how do you know like you're actually making impact. Uh, like the goal here is to actually have a solid ground and like actually have like basically uh, uh, kind of reproduced baselines uh, so that you can actually measure how much your proposed method uh, like it gains. And then like hopefully after like uh, this like uh, what feels like a little bit like a groundwork of like taking other people's code base and getting, getting it to run, you can actually start to uh, like experiment with your own idea. So the next step is to introduce like your change. And the key here is to uh, try to basically introduce like minor changes to existing code bases. Um, obviously like uh, when we first start, you actually need to like understand these methods. So there's a kind of like a more open um, exploratory process where you try to break everything. Um, hopefully, like we've already done that, like uh, like uh, during the initial steps where you're trying to understand the problem and like uh, try to gain like insights on like uh, what could potentially solve the problem. So here, like we're actually trying to like basically develop your own method. What you want to do is that you want to actually build it on top of a very solid baseline that's actually state of the art, uh, and then introduce like uh, atomic changes to like a very small number of places in the code base, so that like you know exactly like where the change is. Uh, and like where the game might be coming from. So like similar to like reinforcement learning, we're kind of like perturbing the code and the algorithm, which is like kind of like our state space. And you want to actually make the credit assignment as easy as possible. That's why you only introduce atomic changes uh, at like a very few places. Okay, so after you introduce your change, we kind of like need to look back and then just like evaluate. Uh, and hopefully because you have already done the work of reproducing their existing results, so like by this point, like 
um, when do evaluation, you can just kind of overlay whatever like you have on top of like what they have. And then like uh, see like uh, either a gain or kind of like a not so much gain or like uh, your method actually like made it a lot worse. So when that happens, uh, it's time to actually like uh, loop, rinse, and then like repeat. Uh, and like uh, sometimes uh, you introduce further changes. Sometimes you realize that like your, inter your intuition is actually quite misguided because uh, you didn't talk to enough people like about this idea. Uh, and sometimes you realize that, wait a second, um, I was actually wrong in terms of like uh, identifying like what the problem is. It's actually a different problem. Like I thought it was a learning rate problem or I thought it was like an architecture problem, but wait a second, it's actually like the objective's missing term or something like that or vice versa. So like you can go back to like any one of these earlier steps and like uh, uh, you'll be gaining much intuition on like basically the problem, like uh, the domain, uh, the code, and then like you'll just become faster and faster when you go through this loop like multiple times. So, uh, so far we've been talking about basically motivation of doing like impactful research and like importance of building on top of others. For the rest of the talk, we're actually going to focus on this last part, which is how to experiment quickly and effectively uh, with like a clear and solid steps along the way. Uh, I'm going to pause here just a little bit uh, in case uh, anyone has uh, any questions. Uh, like uh, if uh, you have questions about this, please raise your hand. Anybody, Josh? <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, since no one has questions, uh, I guess we can just move on. Okay, so we're going to talk about like uh, the technical like aspect of how to actually make uh, like uh, uh, be effective at experimentation with a clear and solid steps. So uh, as an overview, uh, we're going to first talk about how to actually set up Python code base as a module. And maybe I can hand this over to uh, Avery uh, in a few seconds. And the second step is our, we're gonna talk about like, how to manage hyperparameters. Like what, what are like the good patterns of like managing your hyperparameters? Like what are the problems of the uh, standard ways of uh, like the dealing with hyperparameters in like uh, these code bases and like what are our proposed solutions? Um, and then like, finally, I'm going to talk about like uh, the important, some of the like uh, more newest aspects of doing research of like how to actually battle the enemy of variance and why you should be uh, always running with multiple seeds and like uh, actually producing publication quality visualization at each step instead of just having a single like a uh, learning curve and how why like uh, you should never like evaluate on a single Atari like a uh, learning suite game and like uh, why like these uh, learning suites are always supposed to be used as a suite so you should be testing over multiple different tasks. Uh, okay, so uh, now I'm gonna hand the, the uh, presentation to Avery and maybe Avery can share your screen. I'm gonna stop mine. Uh, can everyone see this? I think we're yeah, good. Yeah, we can okay. hear you now. Yeah. yeah. So I guess uh, like first I'm gonna talk about like how to organize your Python code. Um, Python's a little weird, um, and that your main module kind of depends on your entry point. And Python has a lot of other weird things about it because it's originally designed as like a scripting language. Um, so your main module depends on your entry point. Another thing is local imports like produce duplicates sometimes, depending on like how you're importing modules um, and where you're, whether, whether you're using global, relative or local importing. Um, and your current working directory also gets injected into your system path. Um, so that can also produce complexities in how you choose where to import stuff from. So generally um, on the right side, we have like, um, sample structure of like a Python code base. And we, we generally try to create different modules and separate code into different parts that'll import, you know, either from the, the module you wrote. Um, and there's, there's a bunch of reasons why we do that. So this is like a pretty generic um, project that I think like has, has a good structure. Um, 
you have your DMC gen as its own module with init pi. Um, and you know, these, these um, files can import from each other. And then again, on the, on the other side, you have your actual experiments here, you know, learning rate sweep here, and it'll import this module and actually run your, your training code. Um, so I guess uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about like why, why do this and why not this? Um, does anyone have any uh, thoughts as to why um, or any guesses as to like what, what sort of problems this sort of thing can introduce? Um, feel free to just speak up or raise a hand. So I can't really see too much so. Um, okay, I don't think I see any hands, but just generally, I guess I'll just go into it. Like imagine you wanted to just import enum from utils in your like in your train.py. Enum uh, utils is also a third party package that's that's called, um, but this won't work anymore because if you're trying to import utils, it'll import your utils file that you wrote and not the actual third party package. Um, and this is kind of like a naming error because now, because you have a file that's named utils, you're no longer ever going to be able to import any framework that's also named utils. And this, uh, you know, you can run into this issue if you like name files kind of generically and, you know, some other module already has this name. <laughs> and another uh, issue that you can run into here is um, you can have double imports. This happens like pretty rarely, but it still can happen where you're importing the same thing under two different names because you're misunderstanding how to import it. And uh, for example, here you're importing from the, the package DMC gen utils, and here you're, you're attempting to import it as a third party package, but it's really just, you know, because it's in the same directory and the working directory, um, it'll also uh, import utils directly from there. Um, I guess I'll, I'll give it back to go um, to continue here. Uh, okay, let's go with the hyperparameters. Uh, yeah, that's right. Give me one second. Okay, so uh, here I'm going to talk about uh, kind of like uh, the uh, uh, avoiding uh, like a uh, hyperparameter hell uh, with like uh, declarative like uh, design patterns. So earlier, like uh, uh, like uh, Avery talked about basically ways to structure a Python code base, uh, and then like because we're talking about like uh, doing RL research at a scale, like uh, like uh, there are kind of like a few other problems that kind of appears. Uh, because uh, you're managing like a lot of different experiments running at the same time and uh, and you have like a lot of hyperparameters to, to deal with. So in this case, uh, like I want to introduce this idea of like a parameter hell. So the idea of a parameter hell is that like we have like a more than you know like 20 different parameters for your like a machine learning like a projects that are all kind of defined as like strings or like a function parameters with like a click or arc parse. So the problem with this uh, with this uh, case is that like uh, like typically your IDE actually does a lot of work like uh, heavy lifting in the background to actually understand your code so that it can help you like basically not make any mistake when you actually introduce like changes and the problem with like uh, a lot of these like uh, um, argument parsing like uh, syntax is that like sometimes your IDE actually has a hard time understanding what they are like in particular like. Uh, Especially like when you're actually using like YAML files meant to actually like uh, manage your hyperparameters, uh, there's no way for the IDE to actually understand that your YAML files should actually be like uh, basically using some kind of like a schema, uh, like according to like a particular pattern. So the the solution that we propose here is that uh, let me try to explain this. There we go. There we go. Okay. 
So uh, like the problems we have is that like it's a source of bug. It's very common to actually have like something like with underscore with like a different like a letter, for example, like random seed, and then you type random seed. And then it's like somehow like a, that's actually not recognized. So all of your runs are actually using exactly same random seed because like you type it wrong. So that's a source of bug we want to like prevent. Because you cannot really remember all of the hyperparameters you have typed, you have like written, it's much better for like your ID to actually help you with that instead of having you actually remember everything. So you actually want to like your ID to actually tell you when you're, what, you, what you have is wrong. And then there's a problem like ease of use. So like, like if you actually like do everything as like arguments like from the command line, it's very easy to actually have like a, you know, like a very long like a, like a, a, like a command with like a many different things. That's why people start to actually use a YAML file to, to actually uh, like manage their hyperparameter settings for different experiments. But as I said earlier, that also poses its own problems because the YAML files can also contain like bugs of like a mistyped uh, like arguments. And if you actually work with like, like a basically code bases that you just like download from GitHub from like other papers, it's very often to actually see, encounter this type of bugs in published code that people do not catch like when they're publishing like their paper and their code. And like most of the time it's benign because uh, the result is still, still solid. But sometimes like, you know, like you can actually get one of the debug debugging flags wrong. And it turned out that what you publish is actually not what you claim. It can be extremely embarrassing. So like bugs are actually pretty costly in terms of both like turnaround time, compute, and sometimes like when you actually publish it like as a, like a paper or like the open source code base, it, it, it can have a lot of like a sort of like social downside as well. So you we want to actually like to try to minimize that as much as possible. And then finally, like when you actually evaluate result, so like it's very easy for a paper to have, you know, like a, like a five or six different baselines running over like five or six different like environments, but that's like 30 combinations. You can actually do that like manually by like just like making these YAML files by hand. But like it's very hard when you have like a sort of like a product between like a two parameter sweeps. And like sometimes you have like three or four dimensions of parameter like you want to actually like mutate like in the publication. So like you want to actually be able to like evaluate these results on a scale. Like sometimes 220 different runs, like sometimes like like a hundred different combinations. And sometimes like uh, you also do this like over a very long like period of time. Like it's it's not very atypical for me to go back to like something around like two weeks ago or like to go back to something around like a year ago. Um, so you actually want to like have like good design patterns so that like this is actually like still feasible. So what do we propose? So like if anyone is like familiar with like front engineering with like React or Angular, um, you know like there's this kind of like thing called like the, the declarator pattern, right? As opposed to you know like an imperator pattern. So instead of actually like a, just like a writing art parts like a, like a command arguments like a, like using like strings, we take advantage of like Python namespaces and declare our arguments as basically like a, this kind of like attributes under like a Python namespace. So that's basically a bare bone like a Python class. We make it easy to actually also use these like a Python struts as like a command line arguments, which is why we created this library called like Prems Proto that actually automatically takes this uh, like Python namespace and then generate like argument parsing, like logic for you, depending on like the, the type and the value of like what you put in as the default. Um, and uh, it also supports basically like a multiple different like a name struts, like uh, living under the same like argument parsing like scope. Uh, so on and so forth. So this is the pattern we're, we're proposing. Basically, try to declare all of your uh, like hyperparameters uh, under a Python like a uh, namespace uh, in a way that's like similar to a C strut. Um, and as you can see here, we can actually have some uh, pretty like a dynamic like a logic inside these uh, like a declarative uh, like a like a like argument like a schema. By actually like a like conditioning on uh, like a, some of the debugging flags, and like what this allows us to do is that this allows uh, like your IDE to actually automatically understand what you're like uh, trying to do. So, for example, here I'm actually trying to uh, uh, like uh, uh, override some of these like default values in the parameter sweep. So what I'm doing here is I'm just like basically typing and you can see that my ID is actually telling me uh, like um, 
what the name of the like a particular parameter is. So like I almost like I almost like never make mistakes because of this. And we can also see that because it's actually now understandable by the IDE, I can actually just click on one of these parameters by like uh, moving my cursor over, over and then like press command B to actually jump towards declared. And then like at the place where it's declared, I can like type command B again to find all of the usages across the entire code base. So like with this kind of like a single top pattern for like uh, these like a uh, Python, um, for hyperparameter is like a uh, Python like a uh, namespaces, we can do all of these without like making mistakes. So like, as you will see later, we also provide like utilities for doing like hyperparameter sweeps in this kind of like a declarator pattern. And this is like a pattern like, a, like we developed like when I was like doing my internship at DeepMind. Um, and uh, so like uh, basically uh, the point here is that you can actually, uh, you can actually like uh, just take this uh, like a hyperparameter, uh, like a, a helper function sweep which uh, if we wrap around like uh, some of these uh, params proto, like a uh, uh, like, uh, um, like, uh, Python namespaces, like we declared earlier, uh, so actually automatically overwrite the, the getter, actually what's happening like under the hood. And directly I can actually start overriding these things. For example, I can change like the policy, like a learning rate, I can change the, uh, like whether I actually clip the, impu the inputs. Uh, and I can also modify the visualization interval because like, I, like I'm running this for a very long time. I don't actually want to like overload and there's like indentation error here on this like third line. And then after that, I can actually do like a product between like two sweeps. So here I actually zip like these four combinations of like an environment name, number of epochs, number of workers because all of these different like a fetch robot tasks that like a Josh actually mentioned earlier they require like a base, they are, they're, they are at different difficulty levels. So they require a different number of like parallel workers. They require like a, like a different kind of like a number of epochs actually run to like saturation. Um, obviously they also have different names. And like, so I can actually like zip those together and just have like four combinations and then like a, do a product between that and like the random seeds. So this way I can have this like a very simple single script. And then like, basically this will be this can like just reproduce the entire like uh, experiment grid I wanted for this particular plot. So I can put this into like experimental folder that Avery mentioned earlier, and then have basically my documentation for this experiment, my analysis script that, that generated like a, like a nice like a publication quality data all within the same like experiment folder with like reproducible like launch script. So here. Like, I don't actually have the launch, which actually involves a different tool we're going to talk about soon. But like here, object, and then like a basic get via like a local uprights, like we specified on the top, and everything's super transparent. You can actually see like we are actually like like a uh, 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 like overriding like for this particular run. Okay, so this summarizes sort of like a, the overall scheme where like, you know, like we uh, declare like hyperparameters as like Python namespaces using this library and uh, which allows us to have all the completion and like uh, allows like a uh, IntelliSense, which is the uh, like code analyzed analysis engine inside the IntelliJ IDEs to understand like uh, what we're up to and like uh, tell us when things are like uh, has like a mistake in it. Uh, and then like finally, like this allows us to actually manage like, hyperparameter sweeps on the scale very easily without making much mistakes. So um, for the next part, uh, like uh, I just want to like uh, do a quick like a high level summary, which is, uh, you know, like this is the flow we talked about earlier, which is like start with the problem, uh, like uh, have some intuition, uh, find closest neighbor, download other people's code base, like reproduce the results introduce like your atomic change and then like evaluate and loop on so, so on and so forth. So like your goal when you do like a uh, experiment, it should be drive the cycle. Like with every single like uh, iteration, you should be gaining some intuition of what the problem is or have better like insights. And like everything should actually like uh, be leading to like um, measurable performance differences or like a gains, like according to like a, a particular like uh, evaluation metric that you think is relevant. So this should be your goal. You should be driving the cycle. Uh, and then one thing that appears like, uh, like uh, very quickly is that you realize that, especially with reinforcement learning, variance is actually like a, like a huge enemy. 
So what do I mean by that? So this plot is actually taken from the taken from the uh, soft anti-critic paper. I think it's like figure number six or something like that. Um, so here I want you to focus on the red curves. So this is like on the uh, this is this is uh, like a learning curve on the uh, Mujuko uh, humanoid environment produced by the RL lab uh, code base. So I think, I believe the, uh, the red curves are produced by DDPG, which is like, kind of like the general, like a baseline for like uh, uh, for actor critic methods on these continuous control domains. The main takeaway from this plot is that you can see the dense red curve is the average between like uh, individual runs between like five different random seeds. And each one of the like the light, uh, like a very jacked curve in the background are individual seeds. So like with like uh, the DPG baseline, the result is like extremely like noisy. Like every single seed can be like a drastically different. So and this type of like variance between otherwise seemingly like benign hyperparameters such as like a particular choice of random seed often occurs with reinforcement learning. And much of the reason is because uh, like in reinforcement learning, uh, policy learning is driven by like sample collected by the policy itself. So like data distribution is not necessarily great. And even when the policy is great, it causes your policy to crash. So it's like not uncommon for things to like a never take off or take off like a relatively early on, depending on the random C at the network initialization. And it's also very common, like, like, like it's like for a very long time, I think like even nowadays, like a DQN actually crashes after like a running for like a very long time. And like in the original, like you can paper that like uh, they also had this problem. I think like they just somehow figure out like I said, a hyperparameter for that they actually truncate the learning curve before the crash happens. So basically, the message here is that variance is a huge problem, and it's not uncommon. Like it just happened to like our recent paper, like a, like last month, that like a we're just running like a single seed. We thought we're actually like producing really good gains, but it turned out that one of the adversarial like losses we introduce actually introducing like a learning stabilities, which means that if I average between five seeds, even though my top seed is actually like a matching like a, the Oracle performance really well. So the, we're really happy with, with that result. But because of, this, because of this instability, like if I average over things, my performance is actually only like 80% of like, you know, like the Oracle performance. We still produce a gain compared to like baselines, but also about like much more disappointing. So lesson here is that, you know, like we keep making this type of mistakes, uh, like uh, it can really be mitigated if we actually like uh, like uh, like actually do the do the following things. I'm going to talk about the next slide, which is running multiple seeds always instead of like uh, running like a single seed, and always try to produce. Publication quality, like a visualization from day one, so that you know that you're actually like seeing the same. And then like another like more subtle point uh, that like, uh, I think like it uh, usually takes a while for people to actually like uh, realize it's after like a, a paper or two. It's not like a very meaningful to actually like run your result only on a single task. So I actually don't have like a, uh, like a, I actually don't have like the, the inset for the figure here, but take any paper and like uh, that involves like continuous control and just look at their baselines. So like the center, like five tasks will be like worker run, worker stand, like, and then like cheetah run, and then like humanoid and so on and so forth. You can see that the performance gain between these like methods differs drastic, drastically depending on like the task you choose. And these are like tasks, like uh, these could be like different tasks on the same domain. For example, like on worker, you have like worker run, worker stand, worker like walk. Or it could be like different, like kind of like a domains within the same like testing suite. It can be like worker cheetah or humanoid. And depending on like the test and domain, like things can be very different. So the main like message is that you're not supposed to use like individual games from the Atari like a learning suite. 
like quoting the original author, like uh, Balomar. And you're not supposed to you know, just like take one of the tasks from like magical environment, just run on it. Like you're really supposed to take like, like basically the entire like learning environment or the entire like task, like a uh, uh, control, like a suite to actually have like holistic evaluation of your method. So to battle like various due to like seats, different like domains conditions, you need to actually do both of these. And this, like I, you see that like the number of combinations is actually quite a lot. Uh, and this is the mo this is the reason why, like we actually want to like figure out ways to do like a, this type of like a, like iterative like experimentation, like with a certain like a level scale of like a parallel like using like a parallel computation. So like publication quality plots like this involves you know like four different baselines, five to ten seeds each, and just to produce these two plots, you need to actually write like forty combinations, and this is like. Yeah, so you need to do this. Okay, so the question is, how do I actually produce these things? For example, these like learning table, and, and the most important thing to know here is that you see the learning table actually has these like a variance like a number, it's like plus or minus like 133, like uh, on, on top of like 556, right? How do I actually produce these tables? And then how do I actually produce like a, these learning curves actually averages between different random seeds? Okay, so uh, here's a high level view of the workflow. So we have the workflow from we had earlier, which is like understand the problem, uh, have intuitions of like your proposed methods, take other people's like code base by finding the evaluation, mutate their code base by introducing a different like workflow. And this is a workflow from the perspective of uh, like a like a scaling the computing. So initially, like you just want to get everything to run. So in this case, like you kind of just like want to run everything locally. So because I work from like a MacBook, I don't even have like a like a like a uh, like a GPU like accelerator on my MacBook. Like I even like basically try to run locally without the GPU. And the reason is because what I'm going to show you very soon is that I'm going to show you like a live demo of like debugging these type of things. Is that like running locally gives you the best way to actually debug your code very quickly using interactive debugging tools, like uh, in an integrated uh, like a develop, development environment, and like visualize things very easily and do inspections and like uh, even do like you know like a like iterative and like a literal programming. And then like after you actually debug everything locally, you can actually run things in parallel and like we're talking about like a, you know like sometimes in the lab we don't have like a really good like a computer infrastructure we just have like a five or six different lab computers with like some like a you know like a, a video game like a gpus on it so you'll be basically trying to launch across multiple like ssh machines and then uh so like and then like sometimes you know like every one of you guys have access to mit's uh, like a uh, slurm clusters like uh, there's a one called satori uh, which is donated by IPM like a few years back. So like this will basically allow you to like run your code like uh, with like uh, with like you know like in parallel like with like twenty or like a hundred jobs depending on like how much resources you are using. And then all of you guys also have access to like hundred or two hundred dollars worth of uh, like a free compute credit from like AWS, Google uh, Compute like a uh, engine, and uh, you know like Azure for Microsoft. So. Uh, so you have like access to all of the computing resources. And the goal is to basically go through like these funnels, like different like a parallel computing infrastructure to pr produce the publication quality visualization we talked about earlier. And like, this is how you measure your like uh, uh, incremental like uh, progress. And this is how you make sure that you're not, you know, like actually like uh, just like shooting in the dark. So like the overall like scheme of this part is that like we want to like actually do experimentation effectively by like a taking clear and solid steps. So we talked about like this kind of overall, overall like flow of like, you know, like running locally, running over like multiple different SSH machines on Slurm and GCE. Like what is the problem? The problem is that like you have these different axes of uh, sort of like a, uh, of like a cost and benefits. Like what we want is like, we want to actually do things on the scale. The scale comes with like these like, uh, like costs. One cost, it's like these overhead. Imagine I ask you, can you just like set up my like parallel like a like a job runs 
it's on like a GC in the next 20 minutes, you're not going to be able to do that because like the first step is that you actually need to like set up your account and then like set up like all the access credentials. So if you're trying to do this like with AWS, it's going to take even longer. So there's like a, a lot of overhead for like uh, setting up shop with each one of these like uh, uh, like a cloud providers or a compute infrastructure. And then like there's also latency. So like when I try to run locally, it takes me, it takes me about like uh, 600 milliseconds for like the Python runtime to actually like load the modules I need. And then like I can quickly get into like where I want to like uh, change my code, which I'm going to show you like in a second via a live demo. And then I like, start writing code and like actually like uh, create like like uh, making making the changes I want to make. But if you actually want to do this on GCE or like AWS, the average launch time is going to take at least like two or three minutes or like five minutes or sometimes even longer, like eight minutes. And this is without actually taking into account of the launch latency. These are just like the latency due to like bootstrapping using like a basically Amazon like a machine images, AMIs, or like a Docker images, because all of these things are like basically uh, tens of megabytes or like a gigabytes of worth of like a payload. You need like each one of the machines to download from scratch. So like those latency, like actually introduce like additional challenges to your like experimentation workflow. So it's to basically introduce you to tools that first of all, reduce latency so that you can actually have like a semi real-time like debugging capability on this line. And also like minimizes overhead so that you can easily set up like parallel launches on all of these like uh, compute platforms we, you have access to right now as MIT students uh, by just copy pasting configuration files without actually going there and trying to figure out like a lot of things by yourself. So like because due to the limit of time like we're just going to cover like uh, uh, some of the like uh, like uh, things uh, like the most important things uh, for the rest of them we're going to provide like links to uh, basically the repository. Uh, like a uh, like a uh, on on the on the. Uh, does anyone have like any questions? And also, Josh, how much time do we have left? Just like in terms of time. Oh, thirty minutes. What's that? A little less than thirty minutes. Okay, cool, awesome. Yeah, I guess like we have uh, plenty of time then. Yeah. Okay, awesome. So hope like uh, maybe like, because like this is a lot of these are super technical. So maybe we can leave about like 10, 15 minutes of like question time at the end so that people can ask questions. Okay, awesome. So, so like the first part, we're just gonna talk about like running locally. So we're gonna have this kind of like a uh, different steps of like a, of like a scaling up like your compute uh, and like uh, trying to like minimize overhead of debugging by like actually doing like the easy things first. So here, like I'm going to first show you like a live demo of uh, basically a uh, like how to use how to actually debug like a uh, like a Python code base locally using like these like uh, integrated debuggers. And uh, let's see, hold on. yeah, there we go. And 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 how to actually do like a literal programming with PyTorch or Jax. And then I'm going to talk about like a scaling by scaling up by like a sharing configs and so on and so forth. Okay. So let's first talk about like uh, how to use an integrated debugger. And this is kind of like the thing that's missing from the uh, missing semester from computer science education. Uh, here we go. All right, cool, awesome. So uh, let's see. Okay, great. All right, so um, here I have a code base. I just downloaded it from uh, like a GitHub. Okay, cool. So, oops, I think. Uh, Okay, cool. So, so this uh, like a code base is available here. Uh, and this example, it's basically a practical RL at scale. We're going to share the link with you guys. So everything like we're going to cover here is actually available as a Git repository. And we also like uh, have some like kind of like Git book to go over this uh, 
And so uh, let me give you like first like a high level introduction of like this code base, how it's arranged. So inside we have like a sort of like MNIST example that basically just like a quick, uh, like a sort of like an example that shows you uh, basically how we set up like the code base of like a very simple MNIST training job. And then like we have this uh, MNIST over SSH that actually uses uh, the uh, like a Jane's uh, tutorial we have like on the, in a separate repository uh, that like a kind of like a goes over uh, like a, like the best way to actually like a set up like a parallel runs over like basically uh, like a, over SSH to multiple lab machines. So this one has like a very little overhead in terms of setting up. You just basically like uh, download this code base and then like uh, you'll basically have access to this folder and there's this uh, like a configuration file that actually does everything for you. And then you just like basically follow this uh, like a tutorial to basically set up like a JS, install it. And then like it basically it walks you over like basically how to actually like uh, what, what, what this tool is actually doing in the background by generating these like uh, uh, bash scripts uh, for the remote machine and then like actually how to actually run it. So this is uh, part of the tutorial. So first, uh, and then like we have like a, this one for like a using SSH with Docker, like on multiple like machines. And then like we also have like a one example that's like a little bit more advanced that I can leave to the end, which is, uh, how to actually do Docker-based uh, parallel computation with like EC, with uh, like AWS. And similarly, we actually have like uh, these uh, like configurations. You just basically you configure like environment parameters, and then you, you'll you'll be in business. And then like Slurm is actually like a way for a lot of the high-performance computing clusters to like organize to actually like uh, dispatch jobs and manage resources. It's also very easy to use. Uh, but the problem is that like we actually try to like basically do things on the scale uh, as like a, what like every going to like a go over like a next. Uh, like you can actually have these like a, uh, like a Slurm scripts lying around and it's very difficult to actually quickly spin up new experimentations without like creating just like a bunch of Slurm jobs lying around like as like bash, 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 bash scripts. So like uh, this example is going to talk about how to actually like uh, do this kind of like a uh, sweeps like uh, very quickly with like uh, almost like zero boilerplate code like uh, in the parallelizable fashion like in the way that's actually integrated with all of the tools we mentioned before. Uh, sorry, that was actually like number four. That was like the this, this SORM example. So here's actually like how we actually set things up. It's super easy. Uh, and then like there also include some more advanced like uh, examples we don't have time to talk about. Okay, so this is sort of like the general like overview of this uh, code base. So like a uh, James is actually like a uh, James tutorials. That's actually the uh, uh, okay. Let's do that. There we go. And then like we also have like this uh, like a Docker tutorial. Refactor, uh, and then like here, I'm just going to like first show you this uh, like MNIST example uh, and show you how to basically like do like live debugging with uh, with the uh, PyTorch, Jax, and uh, like a uh, and PyCharm. Okay, cool. So uh, as mentioned earlier, like the reason why we use Integrate Debugger is uh, basically for two reasons. Uh, so first reason is that like uh, uh, when you're, you're using like a like integrated development environment like IDE such as like PyCharm, you can actually get a lot of help that you would otherwise not get from like Vim or Sublime. Uh, for example, like uh, much of the effort in building like a like integrated developing environment like this um, is to is uh, like in this case it's IntelliSense, which is actually like a code analytic engine that actually understands like, what you're writing, so it kind of understands your intent and it works when you're writing code as your second brain. And then like the most important thing is that uh, with these like uh, integrate debuggers, you can actually insert and remove like a uh, breakpoints on the fly without actually have to start restart the run from scratch. So a typical thing with these uh, machine learning code bases, especially with like reinforcement learning code bases, is that sometimes before you can even run your, your like a main algorithm, you need to actually like run like a sample collection for like five to 10 minutes. So that's like, there's actually a lot of overhead in uh, like uh, basically getting to the point where you actually want to change your code. 
And so like the thing that people typically do is that they just like keep rerunning the same call again and again. So every kind of like debugging iteration takes 10 to 20 minutes. And like at some point, like this kind of overhead just becomes a little bit insane. Um, the alternative here is to basically run your code once, stop at the breakpoint, and then like start like basically like playing with the like a uh, like a uh, with the memory and like a uh, the like runtime there. Uh, but like what sometimes happens that is that if you do this with DPG, like you're changing some code and then like you suddenly you want to actually add a breakpoint in like one of the functions like down the road, and you realize that like actually in order to actually add that additional breakpoint which is like a, a way for you to actually save like five to 10 minutes of time to, you know, like of like actually running like into that part of the code, like step by step. You actually have to like spend 10 to 20 minutes to like actually like wait for a sample collection to happen again. So that you can get to that point, which defeats the purpose. So like the biggest benefit with uh, like an integrated debugger, like uh, like the one with the, that comes with the uh, Eclipse or like, you know, like IntelliJ, and somewhat like on the use on this like a like a barely usable level with like a visual like a like with VS Code, um, is that like you can actually insert like a breakpoints on the fly, and like when you pay, pair this with Jax and like PyTorch, both are like kind of like functional in nature. You can write a lot faster, and introduce much less bugs, so you spend much less time like debugging, but more time actually doing research. Okay, so here's a quick demo. Um, I'm just, I'm just going to open like uh, this uh, Amnes example here, and then here, um, uh, I organize the code in the in the following way. So like there there are like these imports on top, and then like uh, here you can see this is kind of like the old pattern of like using arc parse. We, we replace like all of these like arc parsing like uh, boilerplate with a uh, which is very ad hoc to this like a very simple uh, declarative uh, like a pattern here. So what I can also do, I can also do proto. And then in that case, for example, what if like I actually want to like uh, basically have like a help string. And now like basically with this a single command, I just changed this to a command line like the program that I can actually evaluate. So what I can do now is that I can go into, uh, and now I can do Python. Uh, let's see what I'm gonna do. See? Now, like actually, this show up as a uh, like a command line program. Okay, so that was like a quick demo of like basically what you can do with this. And uh, here I'm going to declare my like a network architecture. This is just a very simple Linux, the same one that Yang Kun like showed on his like a bulky like a uh, laptop in like uh, you know like 1995 or 1998. I don't remember. And then like here's like a very simple like uh, basically. Uh, a very simple like a like a training script, and here's a very simple like evaluation script that uh, I'm going to basically uh, uh, try to mess around with. Okay, cool, awesome. So we're going to run this, uh, and uh, uh, because I didn't have breakfast, uh, like uh, I was like I'm, I'm being a little bit slow, and like uh, basically like if I just like run this. It's going to give me some. Uh, oh, sh shoot! I, I think I introduced an error. So what I can do is I can actually fire up my like integrated debugger like this, and then like uh, this is going to tell me that okay. So because this is actually like a syntax error, it happens at the parser as the, as the uh, like a tokenization stage. So like I, I basically just like fix that. Okay, so that was actually not like some bug I can fix with the. Uh, let's do that. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I just wanted to like uh, run it again. Great, so that's actually like a running totally fine, right? I see basically the, the learning progress, except that like at some point uh, it's gonna give me some problems because uh, uh, maybe I should just, uh, okay, so let's do that. So this is gonna take a little while, so like maybe I can just do this. Okay, 
Let's try to run again. Okay. So I just encountered like a, this kind of like a like an exception. It says, wait, the float object has no like a CPU. So what did I do? Okay, I see, I see, it's right here. So basically what I can do is that I have my PyCharm configured so that if I press this, actually like a puts, so I can do this. So look at the console. It shows that, right? So I can also do like basically, let's take a look at test loss. Okay, so that's pretty good. So what is the type of type of this? Oh, I see it's a float. But what about what about like uh, what about this thing? Let me just uh, try to comment that out. Let me take a look at the output. Okay, so output. What is my output? Oh, so that's actually a, a uh, tensor, right? So okay, so that's all good. Okay, so I made a stupid mistake in that like this 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 thing is actually like a it's actually a float. So if I mouse over it, it actually like the ID actually tells me that's a float. So what I need to do is that, so if I run this, it doesn't work, right? It gives me an error. So what I can do is that I can just do this, comment it out, and then run, okay, voila, now it works. Now, now it's working, right? Okay, that's cool. Uh, and like, if I, want to actually, if I actually don't know how to use the locker, I can also do this flush. And then like, it actually gives me like uh, this number. Okay, so that's all good. So now I basically just uh, did a little bit of uh, like a, like a uh, iterated programming. And now I actually know that like basically, okay, so like this part of code is definitely working. Okay. So I guess here I'm doing evaluation. Uh, I kind of like, if, it, if I look at like this code here, uh, I'm first doing evaluation, I'm gonna jump into like uh, basically my training. So I can click here and then like basically just pause my, my point here and then like click on keep running. Uh, unfortunately, I need to restart because uh, I actually int introduced an error earlier. But like basically what I can do is I can be a little bit conservative and just like put a breakpoint here and then try to see if actually like introduces uh, error again by like, and just like do a little bit more debugging. Okay, so, okay, that seems to be fine. So let's just uh, like a basic keep going. Okay, here now I actually stopped at like this train function. So at this train function, uh, what's most interesting to me is actually like knowing whether like things are actually the right shape. Because like for a lot of these like loss functions, like these, uh, Criteria is what we call in PyTorch lingo. Uh, sometimes, like by having like a, a wrong rank for the object you're like actually trying to reduce over, you can actually have like a running piece of code without any like runtime errors, but give you completely like garbage like loss signals and like basically introduce like very subtle mistakes in your like uh, in your, in your like a tensor code base. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I actually place the like a debugging point here. Yeah. I'm going to just take um, a look at like the data. Okay, so I want to look at the data shape. Okay, that's great. So that actually looks quite right, right? And then I can look at the target. Uh, is the target like a single like a array of like a like a integers, or the target is actually you know like a bunch of like probabilities? I don't know. So like we can actually look at that. Okay, so we can also look at the type. Okay, that's great. And then like we'll also look at the D type because. Uh, we want to know like uh, the specific tensor type. Okay, see, this is actually actually an integer, like a, a 64 bit integer. Uh, and now like, so we can do this type of like online, like a literal programming, like uh, in a uh, like a PyTorch code base, if I actually like use integrated debugger like this. And uh, by actually doing this type of things, you can actually like uh, basically write like a bulk call like this, line by line by like evaluating it like this in the console. Like without making any mistakes. So the code you write is effectively correct the first time. Okay, and don't don't forget to lint your code as well. So basically, uh, yep, yeah, just lint the code for you. Okay. Uh, so Do this have one question: uh, How do you yeah. re return the current line in debug? So I think you're asking, uh, like, how do you oh, run the I line? See. Like, what's the actual command? Uh, let's see, I need to look it up one second. So uh, go there and then take a look at basically a key map and then like a basically search for command enter. Yeah, so this is actually the, so you go to find 
shortcut and type in like the I, because I don't remember which one it is. I only remember basically <laughs> which key I'm pressing. So this I found it. So it should be under execute selection in Python console. And then like I usually use like a command plus enter so that I can just do this on fly. Yeah. So as you can see, this is like very fun. It actually makes programming like awesome and nice. Uh, yeah, that's why that's why like uh, like using this is uh, it's great. Okay, right, any more questions? Yeah, I was wondering if we really run that line, like does it, like does it does the program still regard the Python as the original line or the like modified line afterwards? So like if you if this is bug in the loop, will it like still persist in the same run? Yeah, so in general, like a live reload with code only works with the stateless uh, like uh, things like uh, functions. So if you look at like a basic, for example, React how reloading, like that works because uh, React is actually like functional, like a kind of like pattern. Um, and like whenever you have like stateful stuff, like uh, internal states seem to manage, like hot reloading becomes very difficult. Unfortunately, Python is actually like a class and object based uh, like a language. So like the overall like design pattern is not functional in nature. Uh, so like that's actually like not very easy, but I can imagine that it could actually work pretty well with like a JAX. Yeah, but you need to use some of the hot reloading functions. And I think like hot reload is like very commonly used with like a Jupyter notebooks. And this is also why like hot reload with a Jupyter notebook doesn't work very well. So we have like a separate like a library called CMX stands for like common down X that allows you to actually do a literal program directly from a Python script and generate like a markdown file uh, to replace Jupyter notebook because like uh, to get around like this kind of hot reloading problem. Okay, awesome. Um, have, so, yeah. You have one more uh, question in the yeah. chat. Is this PyCharm? Will typing new code while debugging introduce issues if we continue after the breakpoint? Uh, it does not actually. Why don't we just try it out? So, so here, let's just go back here. I did do like anything like a drastic here. So like my breakpoint's still here. Uh, actually, what's gonna happen if I actually do like a print uh, shunt line or something like that. And then like, if I keep running it, Let's just run it one step. Uh, it's going to get confused in terms of the line, like when it actually does the highlight. Okay, so this is actually a known problem, but you can actually continually run like everything. So I can do like basically print uh, not doing much, right? And then like uh, I can just keep going down running like that. Like, uh, and you can see like this is actually being updated. Like the, 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 the tensors are being updated. So this is actually the correct line if I remove the line. And if I, if I do that, okay. And then do a logger dot flush. You can see that like uh, the loss number is actually like, it's actually showing up on the top. So uh, yeah, so I hope that answers your question. Like did I answer your question or? Okay, awesome, cool. Uh, any more questions? Okay, uh, so so this is this is why you want to like do debugging locally, especially with like Mojoko and, and like a PyBullet like environments. Like in that case, you can actually, why don't we just like do a little bit of something fun? So I can do import, Jim, right? And then, well, I'll that. What happens? Oh, I see. Uh, okay, let's do env equals that. Okay, and then I can do m dot render. Uh, do I want to do that? RGB array, and then uh, actually no, I want to just do this. Okay, let's do that. So uh, while true, and then I can do uh, m dot reset. Okay, uh, and then let's. Actually, let's not do that. Let's do like four i image n, and then do like a sleep. And then I can do like a local import. Oh no 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 no! I don't want. To. Okay, that's all good. And then import that, and then I can just do uh, basically m dot uh, step dot action space come on oh there we go see that's like the all completion 
uh, sample like that. Okay, so that's all pretty good, right? And then like I can do like a T range instead of range because I want it to look nicer. And then I can do like a import this. Okay, there we go. So that gets like added to the top. I just need to go back up. Okay, uh, and then go back down here because I want to keep everything together. Okay, there we go. So let's just uh, run everything for 10. Okay, great. So uh, I think it's a little bit slow. So you can see like, this is like one frame every like 500 milliseconds. Uh, so it's going to take us like five seconds to finish this. And then uh, yeah, I think my computer's been a little bit slow. Okay, cool. So, so this is uh, sort of like the, the live debugging I think you can do. Uh, let me go back to here. Okay, I'm just gonna kill this. There we go, awesome. Yeah, see, this is, this is why I actually want to be able to do these things like on the fly, uh, like uh, locally on your own computer. And that's also why, okay, wait a second for this. Okay, there we go. So see, that actually tells me like I actually did not import that. I can just like import it all and it like, shows up on the top. Uh, Okay, great. I think that is thrown me off a little bit. There we go. Awesome. So here's a here's a quick interview and then a, a quick uh, like overview and then. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, do you want to talk about slur maybe or like we're kind of almost out of, out of time. I guess we're almost out of time, so that's fine. Yeah, I think we're almost out of time. Uh... Yeah, that's good. So like, we do you have time to get into like, sort of like high level, like a, uh, like a set of a slurm. Uh, it's actually pretty easy to understand. Uh, we provide like a, like a basically these like working examples that allows you to actually just like clone this code base and then like uh, run the code according to its instruction by configuring some of the credentials. And then like I'd be running code like uh, in parallel, like right away. So like uh, the things to check out is like uh, the Jane starter kit. And like everything we have here is going to be included in this like practical reinforcement learning at scale, like a repo. And we're planning on basically like keep like uh, maintaining this. Okay. All right. Thank you guys for listening. Uh, so any uh, questions? Okay, since no one has questions, I'm gonna show you like basically this uh, distributed like uh, logging thing we have done right there. So this uh, is actually, uh, yeah, someone has a question? In the chat. Uh, thoughts on VS Code versus PyCharm? Uh, so VS Code is much easier to use like when you are actually uh, like uh, basically uh, trying to run remotely because it supports like uh, this like a remote uh, debugging server kind of setup. So like, uh, uh, on the remote server, you'll basically use SSH to deploy some kind of like VS code, like a payload that actually runs the code analysis inside the remote machine. Uh, but unfortunately, the problem with the VS code is that it's uh, built as an Electron app. So like uh, uh, the way that Electron apps works is that like uh, there's like a two like uh, event loops. There's like a rendering loop and there's a like, kind of like a logic loop. So what happens with that is that uh, like uh, there's kind of like physical limitation in like what kind of like a UI you can implement like a, like a, under this kind of setting. So what happens is that uh, like the integrated debugger of like a VS code uh, for the past like a, like four or five years has been like a still like under development. So it's still like at least a couple of years like a behind like what uh, like a PyCharm is able to do in terms of uh, like an integrated debugging like uh, IntelliSense, like code analysis and stuff like that. Uh, so like there's a trade-off, but you just got to use like whatever like uh, you're like most familiar with because like uh, sometimes there can be like a learning curve. Yeah, it's like this kind of like an iterative like a uh, literal programming like part, like a uh, flow uh, is, is the most uh, smooth with uh, PyCharm and other IntelliJ like uh, environments. But uh, I, I do see the benefit of you using VS Code for quick things. I, I when I do like a stuff inside like Docker con containers on like a remote as a AWS machine, I actually use a VS Code for that exclusively because it's easier to set up. Okay, let's take a look at this one. So, 
This is actually like a, some of the like a distributed like a logging thing we did before. So this is actually like you know like a doing like a, like a experimentation and analysis on a scale like how it looks like. So here like I was actually running stuff like uh, like running a lot of stuff. So what I can do is I can just do this. So these are actually the like some of the publication quality like a. Uh, performance data like uh, we generated automatically. So you can see there are like the different baselines. It's all like average properly between the seats. And uh, like I can actually look at selected individual runs like this. And the best part is that I have videos. So <laughs> so this thing called like, uh, it's called like uh, ML dash slash like uh, ML logger is still under development. Not as mature as the other one, but it's like this one's like a five times more work. Uh, so yeah, we'll probably like uh, start including some of these like in the tutorial, like in the future as well. So like here, I actually have like different time steps, so you can actually do this. It's pretty cool, right? Yeah. And you can also like type readmes. So like uh, what I did in this experiment. So you can actually type that up, and then like so that you can actually have notes. Uh, any more questions, guys? Uh, and also, like a Josh, maybe they also have questions like for your part. Let's close up then. Oh yeah, that's right. Juvo is a pretty good reloading one. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so like, uh, okay, I see. So like, if you can use one DB, it's actually good. Uh, like a one, there's like one DB, there's like one DB, uh, uh, there's like a one DB, uh, I can't type this. And then like, uh, there's like a comet, ML, uh, et cetera. Um, I like building my own like visualizations and uh, I want to actually be able to like uh, create these like, so the the main the main reason like uh, so so um, the problem with, so we started building this because uh, we had issues with the tensor board so the way that like tensor board is actually used at like a google is that like you might be running like parameter sweep with like a 20 different combinations of parameters and then like uh, you only like have like uh, visualize like these 20 like uh, jobs like uh, using like a uh, uh, tensor board so TensorBoard does not do like averaging like between random seats. That's like one of the problems that people are running all the time. It's like, just like looking at TensorBoard's plots, like uh, you actually only gets a rough sense. So like at DeepMind, like they actually also have a different tool, like a, a chart builder for actually generating these like good publication quality like charts as well. So like uh, people like, so Tensor, also like TensorBoard doesn't support like distributed logging. So the specific purpose for ML logger is to have this like kind of client server architecture. So you can set up one instrumentation server somewhere in the cloud. So that it's always running in the background and they have like basically all of your jobs across different providers, including AWS, GCE, your own like a Slurm cluster and your lab machines all locked to the same instru in instrumentation server. So that's like why we have ML logger is to like allow this kind of distributed like logging and like TensorBoard doesn't allow that. So both like a one DB and common like allows this. So that's actually like what I was using like originally before I like start building like ML logger and like a ML dash. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so like somehow like a common ML actually gets a lot less like a spotlight than like one DB. I don't know if it's because of the sponsorship thing. I actually always thought like common, common ML, is, ML is actually better than like a, it's actually a lot better than like a uh, one DB in terms of like both like the design and the user experience. Like one DB just always feel like a kind of like a not finished product because like the visual is like still like fairly unpolished. Um, I guess like there's another point which is uh, analysis. So one of the things uh, like that's really important is to basically own your own data. So like, uh, like like the problem we I, like uh, I ran to like uh, with comma I'm not sure like if it's this is a still problem now. Uh, it's like basically lack of ability to actually like uh, sort of like a do processing on the data server itself. So here like uh, I'm actually saving like all the like a uh, uh, like a matrix as basically pickle files or like a JSON lock files. 
Uh, and we also like to provide kind of like a high level API for, uh, for easily uh, like to do analysis. So like basically the way that we'll do that will be something like this. So like I'll basically be doing like import ML logger. And then I'll be doing basically logger dot uh, load or like read metrics. And then I just do basically date and then like slash metrics dot go. And then like, I can actually do something like this. I can do like basically loss and then like uh, something like uh, basically reward episode reward and stuff like that. And then like, I can just have like basically this. And then basically if I just like run this and then like if I print loss, it's going to give me losses like, like that. And then if I want to like spin up like a MyPolylib, I can just do and I can do like This will give me that. And then like, well, I get a plot. So like, we also provide this kind of like high level. So it's a, it's not just that, it's actually, uh, let me go back here. We also provide like utilities for like a, like video logging. So basically, So if you go to our API doc, we have like these like very high level helper functions. So we can do like basically, uh, yeah. so we have like a saved image like that. And then we have like a saved video. So like all of, all of those like are basically, uh, Yeah, so all of these like the videos we like I showed you guys earlier, these are actually like a saved with a single line. You basically just like pass in the frame stack and then pass in like the, the file name and actually gets like sent to this, uh, uh, to this like a remote server that we have set up. And then like, you can actually do this from like every single like cloud provider you want. Um, so yeah, so like uh, these are some of the benefits. Yeah, so we actually support on the fly change. So because we're using image IO underneath, so we do like a, a GIF, uh, basically anything that like FF packs, or like anything that image IO supports. So GIF, uh, PN, uh, PNG, like uh, APNG, if I actually have heard of it, like APN. So the problem with PNG is that, uh, like the problem with GIF is that GIF is really big, right? Uh, MP4 is much smaller because it's compressed. So like uh, we actually got like a 200% performance gain by only sending the mp4 file the compressed file instead of like the raw tensors to like remote server for logging it was actually pretty cool so we do like a basically a local temporary file and then like a dump the binary into that file and then send only the compressed file to the servers which is actually saves a lot of bandwidth um but the problem is that like uh yeah so their apng actually like uh can be played as an image on like a uh, HTML files but it also has compression so that we also support that uh and we also support basically uh save figures so we support like a directly saving ML, uh, like a matplotlib figures on the remote server as well. So we have like all of these things. You can take a look at the, like a readme of the, of the repo. Okay. I think I'm done like uh, with everything I want to cover.